This is ODAT Chat, your instant connection to recovery and community, one day at a time. This podcast may contain strong language, sexual content, and spiritual truth. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to ODAT Chat. My name is Arlena, and I'll be your host. This podcast is brought to you by audible.com. This is actually my personal favorite app. I currently have about 60 titles on my phone and I actually didn't even realize I had that many until I started writing this intro. But uh, if you're anything like me, uh, when you have uh, occasional voices in your head that are not so positive, um, it's nice to be able to fill my head with um, positive things like books and learn something positive that'll not only benefit me, but benefit someone else. So if you like Audible books, you can actually get your first book free through audible.com. And uh, what you can do uh, to get your first free book is go to odatchat.com. You'll see the offer on the right hand side. And yeah, first hits free and I know you'll love it. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in today. I have a very special guest for you. His name is Tim Ryan. He's the author of From Hope to Dope, A Man in Recovery. He is a nationally known speaker and thought leader in the opioid pandemic crisis. Actually, he was just published in uh, the magazine Real Leaders as one of the top 100 visionary leaders of 2018. And this is alongside of people like Oprah and Bill and Melinda Gates. Tim is also a TED Talk speaker, a former convict, a father of seven, and a top-ranked barefoot water skier. Tim, welcome to the show. How are you today? I am blessed to be a part of your show. (laughs) You're so sweet. I am doing fabulous. I am super excited. I spent last night um, doing some research on you. And um, as we were just chatting about before we started that, I am super excited that I caught you on the way up because you're going to do huge things. You're all over the news on all kinds of shows. So I really appreciate your time. You're, you've been so generous with me, and uh, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I am as well. I mean, that's what it's all about. You've got to give back. You've got to stay humble. And I go back to, you know, four and a half years ago, getting ready to walk out of prison and and trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And God directed me and here I am today. Well, listen, you are such a miracle and and thank you. We're going to do good stuff today. So uh, how about we just start with a few warm up questions? Sure. Okay. So just out of curiosity, as a public speaker and recovery advocate, I know you travel a lot. So where are you physically located today? I live in Naperville, Illinois, which is about 30 miles west of Chicago. Um, I grew up in a town, Crystal Lake, Illinois, which is about a half hour south of the Wisconsin border. Oh, okay. So you're not too far from where you grew up. And um, how much do you travel? Uh, How much do I travel? (laughs) Well, let's see. Last Tuesday, I flew to San Antonio was right into a couple of treatment centers. Wednesday, I spoke at uh, University of Texas, uh, Texas Universe, Texas Christian University. The next night, I had a uh, speaking event for the Oxford Houses. I was on a plane to Maryland. Oh, very cool. Spoke at a uh, big event there, was on a plane that next morning to uh, Cleveland, Ohio, had an event there Saturday night. Home Sunday, I'll be home for four days, and then I'm back on the road to Florida for four days, and then to L.A. for three. So I probably travel, I don't know, 200 days a year. Oh, my goodness, that is a lot. (laughs) I saw you on Instagram, and there was a picture of you in the airport, and you're like, I'm in airports and on airplanes all the time. (laughs) That's, you know, I live, but, you know, I, I... I jokingly complain, you know, I did two days in a row, I had to get up at 3.30 in the morning Oof. to get to, the, to be on 6.30 a.m. flight. But this was, this is my calling. And, yeah. and you have to commit to doing this. And, and people think I've got this great, glamorous life. You know, oh, you're on TV, you've published a book, you get to travel. Well, yeah, but I've got a two and a half year old daughter and a wife and I have a bunch of other kids and I need that balance, mm. but I also need to do what 
I was chosen to do. Um, you know, I struggled for 30 years, and that was truly my training ground for what I do today. Hmm. And I'm blessed. I hit my knees every morning, and thank the Lord I get to do this, and, and every night, because it's it's a gift. And Unfortunately, I walk over a, a lot of dead bodies. I've been to 122 funerals oh in goodness. three and a half years. In three and a half years? Yeah, three and a half years, Oof. 122. Wow. Yeah, first one was my own son, but we'll get to that. Yeah, I, I want to talk about Nick because, I mean, I can't imagine um, how difficult it was to deal with that. But, um, yeah, we'll definitely get to that. And you mentioned you speak to recovery cent- treatment centers, schools. Uh, I know you do some pr- churches. Yeah, I have. I mean, I do. I've spoken to. I do middle schools. I do high schools. I do colleges. I speak to drug court services. I was out mm. in Tulare County, California, about three months ago, speaking to one of the largest drug court graduations in the country. They had. 2,000 people in the audience, 250 people graduating the drug court, you know, the Illinois Sheriff's Association. I was just in Indiana for 400 court and probation officers. I speak to a a lot of law enforcement on how to... You know, I started the second program in the country where uh, somebody struggling with addiction can walk into a police station in Dixon, Illinois. In two and a half years, they put almost 300 people into treatment and it spun off. And we can't arrest our way out of this problem. And it's having to not only educate on Narcan, on how to work with people struggling with substance abuse. And and nobody grows up and says, hey, you know what? I want to be a drug addict. I want to be an alcoholic. I want to be a heroin addict. But, you know, it was really powerful when I spoke to these probation officers. I was the keynote for an hour and a half, and I did a breakout session. 380 of the 400 people came to my breakout session. Wow. And a lot of them said, Tim, you you really gave me a new perspective because I go into work and I see the same people in the system. And it's how do we work with this and how do we quit putting people in the same local treatment center and expecting them to come out to the same town and stay sober. We're setting people up to fail. So let's look at getting them out of state into a four to six to 12 month program. And, and the judge can let them do that. And yeah, I mean, it's crazy. I do another program called the cop and the convict. I I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, that's a great presentation. so I, it, it's really interesting. Detective Wasaki, who retired from the Naperville Police Department, he's now partnering up with me. About three and a half years ago, he had a program called Dare to Know. Dare to Know what your kids are up to. And Rich is a cyber crimes expert, SWAT sniper, and he had to, he goes after sexual predators. Well, the kids today are doing everything through their cell phones. And if you get into their technology, you know what they're up to. Just go look at their Instagram, their Snapchat. And we give away cell phone monitoring software where you can mirror your loved one's cell phone, computer software, how to drug test, why to drug test. And a lot of parents don't know what to do. So we do this presentation. We walk through the software. I share my story. But then we offer the resources, too, you know. I do four different things. My full-time job, I'm national director for Transformations Treatment Center out of Delray Beach, Florida. We've been around 10 years. They have Christian-based, 12-step-based, first responders, veterans programs, 18 to 30, 30 and up, gender-specific, phenomenal trauma therapists. But unfortunately, we only take good insurance or cash pay. Then I run Man and Recovery Foundation, which is a not-for-profit to where I guide and direct people into treatment, a lot of indigent that don't have resources. So I'm connected all over the country on where we can get people in. If it's a thousand dollar fee and we have the funds, we'll pay it. Um, I I just sent a check today for for two young ladies that are getting into a sober home. So we'll pay for them to get get in there. Um, Obviously, I speak all over the country. And then I'm an advisor to a company called Rehab.com which is the only transparent portal where someone can find treatment that is not owned by a treatment center. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm in the thick of this stuff. Yeah, you are. And then I run support groups and, 
you know, I do all sorts of other things, but uh, I, I I love what I get to do today. It's a, it's a blessing that I'm able to do this. And the crazy thing is you get arrows shot at you. Oh, you don't have any credentials. What do you know? <laughs> well, no, I technically don't have any credentials, but I have 30 years as a drug addict, as a very successful business entrepreneur. Um, I've been to the depths of hell. I've lost everything. I turned my life around by applying the principles of a 12-step based program in my life. I've assisted over 3,000 people into treatment. I've done 1,500 interventions. I've had six people not go to treatment. So I've applied a lot of my recruiting skills into what I do today when I meet with someone. I just talk, I share, and unfortunately, I have a story that most people I wouldn't ever wish on. And I take my experience, strength, and hope and, and, you know, hopefully get them in. My job is just to get people in, and when they get out of treatment, whatever that looks like, to guide and direct them into recovery, whatever that looks like for them, whether they want a maintenance program, they want Christian-based, 12-step-based, refuge recovery, smart recovery, see therapists, work out, do yoga, do what works for you. Right. Um, just because I attend a 12 step based program, it doesn't work for everybody. So do what works for you. And I'll, I'll love you and I'll support you. And if you fall, I'll pick you up. That, that's you, the unfortunately, essence if you, of it. If, if you die, I'll show up at your funeral. Yeah. You know, it's, that's the reality. Yeah. I was going to ask, and thank you for sharing that. I mean, there's, I'm going to list. So just so you know, and the listeners know, when I publish this episode, I'm going to go ahead and put a list of all the resources that you mentioned. You're going to cover a lot of ground here today. So I just want to be sure to let everyone know that we're going to put all this in one central place so that they can reference back to it. So, um, because you're sharing a ton of good stuff and you know what people who are criticizing you, I mean, f- them <laughs> because, absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't, at first I used to take it personal and it's like, look, I, I had some father. Well, you didn't help my daughter. After my t- my TV show, my documentary aired on A and E in July. We had two thousand phone calls in about ten days, and I had wow. six people at my house. We answered every phone call, but a majority of the people that needed help were on very high end levels of methadone and or Suboxone and had no resources. Mm. And there, nobody will detox you off these. So you know, I can why not hook them to. A- because it costs money. You know, you're on 100 milligrams of methadone and you have no resource. Not many treatment centers with good insurance or cash pay will detox you off methadone. It's too dangerous Um, because it could be, I had a kid on 180 milligrams. He was in a detox for 30 days and still dragged ass for another 60 days before he finally got through treatment. He was dead uh, two months later because he opted to go use again. Oh my God! So when so when they're on that, the suboxone, um, that's a I, I'm not I'm sorry I'm not that educated on it. So suboxone is like a replacement for heroin. So so repo- suboxone is what they call an opiate angst. It it's a partial opiate, but it has no oxen in it. Where it takes away the cravings, okay. but it's still an opiate, and it can be very successful if someone is working with the right doctor and or psychiatrist or seeing a therapist and they're, they're living a life of recovery. But a lot of people, all right, well, I'm not doing opiates anymore, but they're abusing cocaine, benzodiazepines, ecstasy, alcohol. You're just trading one for the other, but a lot of people lose their insurance or state insurance and it's very expensive. And if they're on eight milligrams, you can't just detox off it. You have to be weaned down properly and people get stuck on it then. And the same with methadone, most methadone clinics, you go every day, you pay your hundred bucks a week, you get on a hundred milligrams, try kicking that. That's going to take you months to kick. And it, it's, it's most people end up going back to heroin or, or to pills because, it doesn't work. So at the risk of going down a rabbit hole, which is, which is fine. I'm just curious what in an ideal situation, if someone's on heroin and I'm not saying, you know, we're not trying to pretend like we're doctors or anything like that here. I'm just, I just don't know. I'm trying to educate myself as well as uh, the listeners. What is the best way to get off heroin? Uh, (laughs) That's a great question. It's supposed to be done working with a, a, a psychiatrist, the doctor. Most people, I, I've got a really good addictionologist I work with. He's triple board certified. And I went into his office and I said, 
you need to explain this to me. And he said, Tim, there's three types of people I deal with. The person that should use Suboxone for, for detoxing off opiates seven to 10 days, that's it. There's a person I will not prescribe it to because they will abuse it. Mm -hmm. But then there's the people that really want to get off it that are on it 12 to 24 months. And then they'll transition to Vivitrol, which is a, a monthly shot. But actually with uh, Suboxone, now they're coming up with a monthly injection because you're taking an addict. And if they got the, the film strips or the pills, they sell them. So right. it, it's a big it, It's a big dance. You know what I mean? Right. What a mess. It's a tough uh, problem to solve, to say the least. Right. All right. Well, listen, let's, let's circle back to the, the type of speaking engagements you do. So you, you speak to recovery centers and in different groups. Do you have a favorite type of venue that you like to speak to? Oh, boy, that's, you know, anything. I, high schools are cool because when I go into schools or middle schools, I'm not just sharing a story. Mm -hmm. And what really, what scares me too, is I see a lot of these people that are six months, 12 months sober, and they're going into schools and speaking. And then I'm finding out that they have no true recovery or they're on something else and it, it's dangerous. So if you got people out here that work in schools or colleges, you better make sure who you're bringing in is a vetted and carries an insurance policy because these are our most precious gifts, our children, and you better make sure the person going in is carrying the proper message. I don't just share on drugs in my story. I hit on fitting in. One of the big things is bullying today. All these kids are getting bullied, whether it's through Snapchat or social media, all those variables. I hit on snitching. One of the things I'll say to the kids is, how does that saying go, snitches, get what? And they'll all go, snitches. And I'll say, no, that's BS. 95% of the people that get arrested snitch within the first hour. It's called cover your own ass. <laughs> and I'll pull up, but it's a fact. <laughs> and I'll pull up two friends and I'll say, all right, two and Mark, you guys are friends. Mark, what do you do if you see your friend, Sue, going down the slippery slope? Oh, well, I'll talk to her. And I'll say, really? Because that's what my friends did to me. Then what do you do? Well, well, I don't know. You snitch on her. That's what a true friend would do. They escalated to a school resource officer, a counselor, a parent. You contact me. You don't co-sign another person's bullshit. Right. And I hit on the weed. You know, the weed today is 100 times stronger than the weed I grew up smoking. So these kids are at a party. They're smoking some killer weed. They have a drink. Their inhibitions are dropped. And somebody comes up and says, here, start this bag try this pill. If it's an opiate, Pandora's box is open. And oh my God, I really yeah. hit on being a leader, being a leader, not a follower, being true to yourself, doing goals, writing goals, make your bed every morning. That's a goal. Um, and how to accomplish and be careful of who you extend your olive branch to, because you get in a car with that new friend and they get pulled over and there's drugs in the car. You're both getting arrested with it. So, you know, those are the things, but I, man, I, it doesn't matter. Colleges, high schools, community forums, I like to educate and uh, I like to help me people. And uh, unfortunately, I, I have a hell of a story. I get emotional. I, I cry a little bit or I'll get choked up. I get them laughing. But when I walk out of an event, I leave them happy, laughing. I leave them with hope because that's what it's all about. And Literally, when I walk out of a school, I'll have 50 to 200 Instagram friend requests within an hour. Wow. And then the kids will start messaging me. My dad's struggling, my mom, my friend, what do I do? And that's what we do. And we answer every message. A lot of times I'll have my 19-year-old son, Max, speak. And Max will say, look, I'm not an addict. I, I tried a little weed. I, I think I tried acid. It's just not for me. But let me tell you what it was like living with a, a father that was an addict and then him going to prison and an older brother that was an addict and what he had to do and how it affected him. Wow. I'm sure that is powerful. It's powerful. And, and Max is 19. I have not had a driver's license in 16 and a half years due to my bad choices. My son's my full-time driver. We travel the country together. He videotapes. He shoots video. It, it's awesome. And uh, we're doing an intervention about three weeks ago, and 
we're talking with this kid and his parents and my son looked at this kid and he said, you need to understand something. My dad's my best friend in the world. And it just hit me with a ton of bricks. And when we left, I said, Max, did you mean what you said? Mm. He said, dad, you're absolutely my best friend. He, he said, you know, I had a lot of anger and resentment, but I couldn't live in it. I had to move forward and, and you showed me that you're doing the right things. And I'm so proud of you. Oh, my God. It, it tears me up right now just thinking of it. I know. So. I'm sitting here bawling. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's so beautiful. I have two boys, one who's almost 18 and one who's 14. And, you know, as a parent, you, you really want that, that bond with your child and you, you want to be living a life that they can be proud of. And, you know, you guys have just been to hell and back. And, and uh, what a beautiful what a beautiful testimony that is that you guys are so close now and just – you know, doing God's work and, and really educating the masses. And, and maybe that's a good segue. I was going to ask you, you know, the work you're doing is largely educating and ending the stigma, right? And uh, addiction is so right. widespread. You would think everyone knows at least one person who is struggling. And I myself am, am indoctrinated in recovery. And sometimes I forget how much judgment there is towards people um, who are struggling with addiction. Why do you think there is still so much stigma and shame in mainstream society about people that are struggling with addiction? Because people are uneducated. People have this misconception. Thank you, Max. My son just brought me a, a Starbucks coffee. <laughs> That's um, a good kid right there. <laughs> People have this misconception when they, when you say heroin addict or drug addict or alcoholic, they instantly go to the homeless person on the corner with a brown paper bag and a needle in their arm. That still, that's, still that's you think what, that's the image? It, it just shocks that's me. That's what society is breeded, you know, and that's, that's 5% of the people. You know, the average heroin addict today is a 22-year-old white middle-class female and a 23-year-old white middle-class male. Wow. That's your average heroin addict today. The number one cocaine users are Hispanics and, and African-Americans. But everybody, due to the stigma, you should have the willpower. Just stop. Right. I, I, was, do, I was doing an intervention in Winnetka, Illinois. I am at a house on Lake Michigan that's worth 15 to $20 million. The family is personally worth, I don't know, 5 to $6 billion. And I'm, I'm talking with the grandparents about their grandson. And the lady looks at me and says, my grandson is not an addict. He has a character defect. Our family does not breed those people. Oh, and I my said, Your God. Yeah. And this is what I deal with. I said, your grandson spent $100,000 on your Black American Express in three months buying quarter pounds of cocaine off the dark web. You can buy cocaine with a credit card? You can buy anything you want off the dark web. Anything. That's where a lot of kids are buying drugs today. They don't need to buy them from a drug dealer. You can buy them right off the internet and have them is... shipped to your house with the U.S. mail. Wow, that is so crazy. Yeah. But bottom line was she, she kept arguing with me that uh, their family doesn't breed those kinds of people. And I said, uh, your, your, your grandson's an addict. He's an alcoholic. He's got a DUI. He's doing steroids. He's doing ecstasy. He's doing Xanax. And he's doing cocaine. And she just would have none of it. And where is he now? In Hazleton Treatment Center. So, Wow, the denial is strong. It is. And everyone wants to... Uh, you know, I don't care if you're a, you're a good family and you go to church on Sunday. So what? Yeah, it's not a moral issue. It's not a moral failing. Nobody chooses. They made some bad choices, but that's where parents need to get involved. I see so many parents that I'll send their, their kids or their husband or wife or whatever to treatment, but they're not getting any help. They won't come down for the family weekend. They're not going to Al-Anon or Families Anonymous or the support groups I I run, and if they're not getting any help, that person will come back to a jaded, toxic environment, and you're setting people up to fail. Absolutely. But people can still recover, though, if the family doesn't participate, right? Absolutely, 100%. You know, I recommend people, if they're going to treatment, especially these younger kids, they need to go into a long-term structured, very structured sober living community for 6 to 12 months minimum. And, and get your life on track and, and learn to be sober. Because I see so many people, they'll go to treatment, they'll go to meetings, whatever they are, 
and they'll go to work or get a girlfriend or a boyfriend and they, they quit going to meetings and don't put recovery first and they end up using again. And if it's opiates, they're probably going to die. The most important thing in my life is my relationship with God and my recovery. That comes before my wife, my former wife, my kids, my career, anything. Recovery is number one. Without it, I'm dead in the water. I still go to four meetings a week. I have a sponsor. I always sponsor at least one person. That's just the way I roll. Everything else I do is my career. That's not my recovery. I agree. Yeah. Um, let's circle back to, um, I kind of want to talk about, get into like the family of origin stuff because I had a friend tell me when I had my first son that nobody escapes childhood without some issues, right? And, you know, and certainly dysfunction is typically born from childhood stress. And so maybe you can tell me a little bit about what did your parents do for a living? So my, we were all adopted. I've got an older brother. He's just an asshole. <laughs> um, true, true story. True then there's story. me and I, let's see, I'm 49, I think Dan's 51, and my little brother and sister, Katie and Kevin, they're 46. They're three-quarter Chippewa Indian. They're Native American. So I grew up with a lot of racism and, and uh, had to learn to protect my little brother and sister with my mouth and my fists. Oh, wow. um, greatest parents in the world. My dad worked for a little company by the name of E.F. Hutton. If you remember that, when E.F. Hutton talks, Everybody listen. listens, Yeah. <laughs> So he started there. My dad worked at the Chicago Board of Trade for 26 years. In 26 years, he never missed a day of work. He never called in sick. Um, and he worked his way up to senior vice president, ran the whole country. My mom and uh, helped co-found a company by the name of Market Day, which became a multi-billion dollar uh, nonprofit through the schools nationwide where they would have market day sales and 10% of the profits went to the school and it blew through the roof. And, you know, we, when we were poor, we went on uh, a vacation was throw the canoe on the van and a tent in the back and go up to Wisconsin and canoe down the river and camp out for a day. And as they made more money, we got to go to Florida and Colorado and Hawaii and you know, my dad, my grandfather was not born until 1880. He didn't have my father, I think, till he was 64 years old and Whoa. remarried. So my dad, yeah, my dad only went on two vacations with his father and family was very important. So we always went on two vacations a year. My parents were at every sporting event, greatest parents in the world. I was the kid, though that struggled with ADD, dyslexia, learning disabilities. My older brother beat me up every day, total narcissist. Um, a female babysitter molested me at 12 years old. And those are all factors of trauma. Right. So what became my, my solution? Alcohol and drugs. There it is. Yeah, I mean, I recently heard a podcast from Tim Ferriss and he interviewed Dr. Gabor Mate and he was talking about- like, I love that, man. Isn't he amazing? In the realm of the hungry ghosts, read it. I saw Gabor Mate speak in Chicago about a year ago. And maybe, I don't know, there was 300 clinicians. I was probably one of 10 people that wasn't. And, and he talked about that. And he asked how many people here are adopted. And he said, do you, do you realize you're 48,000 times more susceptible to be an alcoholic or drug addict due to the abandonment issues? And wow. everything that guy said what was dead on. He said, throw this disease and choices crap out the window. It all has to do with pain. Yeah. And, and I, I highly recommend people go to YouTube and watch Gabor Mate's videos on addiction. They're friggin' powerful. Absolutely. I just, I had never heard of him before. Um, I actually went to a, a workshop and somebody had mentioned his name and I wrote it down on my, in the notes on my phone. And then a week later, he was on the Tim Ferriss podcast talking about addiction and I was blown away and it was interesting because I've been doing the podcast for not that long, but I've been in recovery for over 23 years. And when I work with girls, it always boils down to childhood trauma, you know, things that happened in childhood. And then there's this pain and stress that we feel and we don't have any coping skills, right? Like when you and I are, you and I are the same age. And when we're growing up, we weren't taught any kind of coping skills like our parents didn't know. We didn't have, hell, I can remember the sex talk. Uh, are you having sex? don't get a girl pregnant, wear rubbers. That was it. That was it. No. <laughs> when, when I grew up, 
it was, you know, nobody was getting DUI. Hell, at my high school graduation, my dad had a case of Heineken. We lived on a lake. We The only thing I excelled at was water skiing. So we're when we were done training, we were drinking beer. And, you know, I, I hid my cocaine use. And, you know, it, it, it was just a different time. But we also would ride our bikes 15 miles to a friend's house and be home at, you know, when the, when the street light came on. And right. People don't do any of these things. And technology has taken these kids' worlds over. Absolutely. Worst thing ever invented was this, uh, every school in this country should ban cell phones. Kids should not be allowed to bring technology into school unless they're using a computer because these kids, you take away their phone, and let it start pinging with Facebook likes or Instagram likes. They start salivating. And kids do not know how to be kids today. Parents don't know how to be parents. Quit being your kid's friggin' friend. You are not your kid's friend. Your 16-year-old daughter is not your best friend. Be a damn parent and get out there and parent and have consequences. And I'll tell you, you don't let your kids charge your cell phone in their bedroom because when mom and dad are sleeping – that's when they're on there and there's so many predators and parents just aren't aware of what the hell's going on out there. Yeah, it's a tough situation as a parent. You know, we've made tons of mistakes and, and I heard your talk about, you know, you, your kids don't have privacy. And, and I look back and I just think of, you know, I struggle as a, you know, I feel guilty, right? I feel like, oh my gosh, I, you know, as a mom, I was afraid to let my kids go outside. You know, there's Megan's Law. You you look online and you see that there are all these predators in the neighborhood. And it's like, it's scary to let your kids... I have boys, you know, and you think that, you know, boys are safer than girls, but they're not. They're not safer than girls. You no, know? not at all. So what did I do? I either hovered or I let them be online with a certain amount of like if they're playing video games like not online games with other kids which I just felt like they were safer but it was maybe it was a lazy choice I don't know I just didn't know what like this world is just not safe any way you look at it and well I tell you and I have my 19 year old son Max sitting here now and he, he will concur. The worst thing we did was buy his little brother a computer. The computer raised Tanner. And unfortunately, I, I, I wasn't a, a good parent. You know, with my other kids, especially Nick, my son that passed away, I was Nick's friend. Um, I let him smoke weed in the basement. I let him drink. And ultimately, you know, we'll, we'll get into that in a, a bit. But Tanner was raised on a computer and in World of Warcraft and Minecraft and all these things. And the social interaction, you know, a lot of it wasn't there. And, and the, the trauma my son Tanner's been through is astronomical. You know, I went to prison. We, they lose, lose their childhood home, have to change schools. I get out. He moves in with me, turn my life around. His brother dies. His brother's best friend moved in with me, was sober 17 and a half months. He died. Oh, my goodness. Uh, my son, one of his best friends from school died. And he doesn't have the coping skills and life skills. And it's been a struggle. And thank God he just started welding in school. And, you know, he's out wanting to be a welder and, you know, graduates that in seven months. He could be making 60, 70 grand a year. But And this is Tanner now? Yeah, that's my 18-year-old son. Oh, okay. He's just a year younger than Max. Yep, yep. He's a, yeah, I was a... Are y'all Irish Catholic, maybe? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I... When I tell my story, when I met my my wife, Shannon, so I'm working in a management consulting firm in Chicago. I'm, I'm making a ton of money. I'm hiring all these people with MBAs and PhDs. I got the boat. I got the Harley. I got the new Jeep. I'm making a quarter million at 26 years old. And I'm oh the guy at the 1.4. Yeah, I'm the guy with the 1.4 grade average who got the 11 on the ACT hiring people from Brown Rice, MIT, University of Chicago, Northwestern, Cal Poly, Berkeley, Harvard, Yale. I'm hiring only the best of the best, and I'm making more money than all these people. And my ego's through the roof. I'm drinking like a fish, doing a bunch of cocaine. Met my wife at work, took her out for a couple of drinks, gave her a kiss, said I'd like her to be my girlfriend. And she said, I have one question to ask you. Do you do drugs? And I said, no, why? <laughs> Absolutely not. I don't do drugs. Absolutely not. 
she said, well, I've got a three-year-old son by the name of Nicholas who's got a dad that abandoned him. He's a drug addict. I want nothing to do with the drug addict. I said, I don't do drugs. She said, good, let's go on another date. She went to Naperville. I went to Chicago and bought a quarter ounce of cocaine. Oh Five goodness. months later, she was pregnant. Um, so I married her, adopted Nick. Max came along nine, nine months after Max was born. She is pregnant with Tanner. Nine months after Tanner was born, she is pregnant with Abby. So, <laughs> yeah, it's good at making babies. Taking care of them is a whole different concept. Right, right. Yeah. But listen, you're a hustler, and it sounds like you come from a family of really hardworking, smart people. Absolutely. My my dad instilled work. You wanted something, you work for it. I started working in his buddy's bar at 9, 10 years old every weekend, Saturday and Sunday. I'd hump up 100 cases of beer upstairs and oh all the God. soda pop and the buckets of ice and I got all the free soda pop, a Hershey bar, a pack of double mint gum and 250. Um and you wanted something, you worked for it. So I've, I've always worked. I, at 14, I, I think at 12, I lied and told the guy I was 14 to get a job at a pizza shop for two bucks an hour. And I've always worked. I, even in my addiction, cause I had a wife, I had kids to support, but ultimately they suffered due to my choices. Yeah, absolutely. But but you always you always were a hustler and it doesn't surprise always. me now that you have like this tremendous, you know, passion for what you do combined with your, you know, that dude that's some hardcore hustle that you're doing to get this this message out and this lifestyle that you're living now. It's and, phenomenal. And I tried you know, it well, it's like my wife now, Kirsten. Um Christmas Day, we went to my former wife, because Kirsten and I have a two-year-old daughter, uh, Mackenzie. She's my oops, and little daughter's never seen her dad drink or use drugs. So we, Christmas morning, went over to my former wife's house and had Christmas with our my other kids, Max, Tanner, and Abby, and had a wonderful time. And as we were driving back, my wife looked at me and said, Tim, you know, you're o I, I'm okay with you traveling and doing what you do, because this is what keeps you happy and grounded. And, you know, she's in recovery. She also struggles with bipolar. When our daughter was four months old, she attempted suicide. Um, we thought it was postpartum depression. It turned out to be un undiagnosed bipolar. So, you know, it's, it's a, a struggle, but I'm fortunate to where she's an at-home mom. Our, she took our daughter to preschool this morning. She's at the gym working out. Her job is to stay sober, work at her recovery, work at her mental health, and, and, and be a happy mother. And, you know, I do what I do. So it's, uh, it's taxing at times, but I couldn't imagine doing anything else. No, absolutely. The work you're doing is so important, and it's so desperately needed in the world. I'm glad that you guys are such a good team. Let's see, there's so many different directions we could take this. So you mentioned, do you want to just back up a little bit and tell me, listen, I heard in some of the, your literature and your online information that you didn't try heroin until you were 32. Is that right? Yeah. So what happened was we're living in a townhouse. Nick's five, Max is 14 months old and Shannon's pregnant with Tanner. And my wife realized that she's living with a full-blown alcoholic and cocaine addict. And Shannon, I, I will never fault that lady. I'll never call her my ex-wife. She's my former better half. She's my dear friend. I, I love her unconditionally because she stuck by me through, through everything. But she didn't know what to do. She right. didn't, in hindsight, she would have done things different. She would have reached out to my parents. She she would have called me on my bullshit, and, and she always hoped it would get better. I woke up and uh, after doing a on a cocaine bender, and my 14 month old son was crawling towards my home office. So I picked Max up, I put him in his room, and I opened my office door, and there was cocaine all over the floor. Oh if Max would have crawled in and ate one of those rocks, it would have killed him. So I started going back to. Uh, a meeting that starts with an A and ends with an A, a 12 step based program. And <laughs> I made it over a year clean and sober, but I'm the guy that always thought I could get sober through osmosis. I hang out with sober people. I'm going to get sober. Kind of got a sponsor, kind of worked the steps. And about a year, a little over a year in, I met a guy, Joel. He asked me to take him to Chicago a few weeks later to move out of his apartment. I did. And as we're moving him out, out of the roommate, out of the room is uh, roommate Saba Pop. Hey, what are you doing here? I said, I'm moving out. Joel, what are you doing? Heroin. You want to do some? Sure. That wow. Just like that. I tried 
Yep. I tried one bag of heroin and that's what I thought I was looking for. I ultimately did heroin for 12 years at the peak of my addiction. I had a $500 a day habit. I've overdosed eight times. I've had two heart attacks. I've been clinically dead three. I've done two stints in prison. And in 08, I went to prison for four driving on revokes in a year because I started getting consequences. I got a second DUI, lost my license for three years. I drove a week before I had to get my license back and got my first driving on revoke. Then I got a second, a third, and a fourth. My second driving on revoke and fourth driving on revoke were eight months apart in Chicago. And I got pulled over by the same Chicago cop twice in two (laughs) different cars. Yeah. So I I went, I went to prison in 08 and uh, let's see here. They gave me a year, but what I, what do you do at 61 days and they release you? But I'll remember, I, I'll never forget being in uh, Stateville Correctional Center where they hold you. Do they figure out what prison they're going to send you to? And my daughter, Abby, turned six to seven. And I couldn't mm-hmm. call her. And my son, Max, turned 10 to 11. And I couldn't call him. And I swore I'd never do this again. I got out. My wife sat me down and said she got a full-ride scholarship to nursing school. And I said, you don't need to work. I make plenty of money. And she said, Tim, the way you're living, you're going to end up in two places. You're going to end up dead or back in prison. And we got four kids to take care of, and I can't rely on you. And Mm. she she graduated three years, top of her class, working full time, taking care of the kids. And I didn't even show up to her graduation because I was dope sick. Uh Um, Yeah, I, I started another executive search firm, had a good run, made a bunch of money, had an office in the Wrigley building on Michigan Avenue and went right back to drinking and doing dope. And then December 16th of 2010, I overdosed while driving, hit two cars and put four people in the hospital, one being a nine month old baby. Oh, my um, God. Oh, wow. Yeah. Narcan had to be used on me five times. I was clinically dead. What is, I'm sorry, what does clinic, what does clinically dead mean? Like I was dead, I, no, no heartbeat, no nothing. I was deader than a doornail. And how did they resuscitate you? They just pump you full of. So, so Nar- Narcan reverses the effects of an opiate overdose. So when, when you go into an opiate overdose, the opiates bind to your brain receptors and it slows down your breathing and your heartbeat oh. and you stop breathing and you die. But when they, when they injected the Narcan, it took them four or five shots. They got a pulse and they mainlined it and, and you come back. It, it knocks the opiates off the brain receptors and you start breathing again. Wow, that is um, so but crazy. They, 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 yeah, they thought I was uh, not coming back. The paramedic did it once, twice, three times. He told the battalion chief to call the coroner. This one was dead. And for some reason, he did a shot under my tongue where there's a lot of blood vessels and Fortunately, it brought me back, but I, I got oh out of jail God. a week later and went, went right back to doing heroin. You know, you're you're unconscious for all this, right? So you never know how bad it was. I mean, I've seen, no. I've had friends who have kids that are struggling with heroin and, you know, the kids OD and they're in the hospital and it's like the scene at the hospital is so dramatic. It's so intense. And the things, the emotions and the roller coaster that the parents go through, it's freaking torture. And the kids come out of it and they're like, see ya, peace out. And they leave because they're completely oblivious as to what just happened. And everybody is left, you know, like gobsmacked. It's like, how can you? Well, so what I, what I'm trying to do, and you bring up a great point. I, I was just talking with the chief of police yesterday and he said, we had a another overdose and as soon as we revived them the the kids said i'm not going to the hospital and took off went used and died a few hours later um i would like to see a law put into place to where if someone is revived by narcan they're put on an immediate psychiatric hold for a minimum of three to five days if that drug was it's not administered they would be dead why are we why are we letting then they take them to the hospital they revive them, they sit for three hours, and they walk right out the door. Hold on. If, if this person wasn't revived, they would be dead, and we're letting them walk right out of the hospital. Put them on a three- to five-day psychiatric hold. That will give people time to come in, peer recovery support specialists, the treatment centers, whatever, to try and convince this person into getting help. 
I'd like to take it a step further and have them remanded to treatment on the spot or put them into jail for six months. It is total insanity, though, that we do revive people and then just turn them loose. It's absolutely insane. It's yeah. absolutely insane. But, you know, the system's fried. And taking, taking addicts and, and locking them in jail, I mean, that's, that's insane. You know, if, and I hate to use this analogy, but if somebody's got cancer and, and you put them in jail for two years and release them, do you think they're cured of cancer? No. So if you take someone struggling with substance abuse and lock them up and release them, do you think they're cured? No. We're creatures of habit. Within 30 days, they will go back to using because that's what addicts do. They got no treatment. They got no support. In Illinois, there's 28 prisons. There's two with therapeutic drug treatment programs. That's it. Every prison should have drug treatment programs. Every county jail should have AA meetings, NA meetings, Christian-based meetings, peer recovery support specialists coming in and talking and meeting people where they're at. And when they're getting released, getting them into treatment, getting them into sober living communities instead of just kicking people to the street. We've got more damn money out there. I mean, look at Jeff Bezos. The amount of money that man makes, if he donated 10% of his salary, everybody in the country could get treatment. It's not a lack of money that's the problem. It, the money is out there and there's people who have lost people that they love. The question becomes, and listen, we can talk about the problem all day long, but let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the solution. And, and certainly you've covered a lot of you know options. But what really is, you know, and I want to go back to what um, Dr. Gabor Mente was talking about, you know, it's about addressing those childhood traumas. And, and I know you've done a lot of personal work on yourself to address the childhood trauma that you endured and 12 steps, um, you know, saved my life as well. And I've, I've done a lot of my work and maybe you can talk to me a little bit about what was the solution for you? So that, that, that Great question. So when I went to prison the second time, let me kind of finish my, my journey. Here. Sure, please so, do, yeah. So I, I catch this case. I know I'm going back to prison. I hire the best lawyer. I said, let's beat this bitch. They never got blood or urine. That's my thinking. He said, Tim, we're not beating this. It's your third DUI, your fifth driving on revoke. You put people in the hospital. They found the spoon and syringe. You're getting charged with that. So I wanted to die, but I didn't want to hurt myself. So I justified in my head, well, if I just overdose, that'll be cool versus putting a gun in my mouth. In the midst of fighting my case about three months in, now all my family knows I'm this heroin addict and I'm taking a hot bath because I'm dope sick and my 17-year-old son, Nick, comes in the bathroom and he said, what's wrong, Pops? I said, what do you think, you idiot? I'm dope sick. He said, not anymore, Dad. Today's your lucky day. And he threw two bags of heroin on the counter. Oh my so God. I got out of the bathroom. Yeah, I got out of the tub and I did them and I felt it good instantly. And I went next room and I said, what in the hell are you doing? He said, don't worry, dad, I'm just selling a little bit. I said, Nick, this isn't weed. This is heroin. And you know what this drug has done to me. And my son looked right at me. He said, well, dad, you're a successful drug addict. And I said, why would you say that? And he said, well, we've got a nice house. You got an office in the Wrigley building. You make a good living. See, in Nick's delusional mind, because I functioned, he thought I was successful. Mm. Three months later, we were doing heroin together. Oh, my God. And that's how I bonded with my son. He started doing it on his own, but he followed in my footsteps. And I went to prison, left our house in foreclosure, didn't leave my wife and kids with anything. I was sentenced to seven years. Um, I got in, in the prison cell two weeks in after defecating and vomiting myself for two weeks straight. I looked up. I said, all right, God, I'm done. Please take away this obsession and compulsion to use, and I swear I will turn my own life over to you, and please let me get into Sheridan Prison. And the next day, I was shipped to Sheridan Prison, which is one of the two therapeutic drug communities in Illinois. They run the West Care Drug Treatment Program. Actually, two weeks ago, I was in that prison for four days speaking to all 1,700 inmates. So wow. there, my cellmate was a former gang chief for 25 years. And all we did was study the big book, the NA basic text, the Bible. We read hundreds of books on spiritual spirituality, cosmic healing, karmic energy, mm -hmm. business books, Tony Robbins, Napoleon Hill, you name it, I read it. I wrote the business plan for my foundation, a man recovery foundation in that prison cell. 
My wife divorced me in prison. We lost our home in foreclosure. I displaced my wife and four kids. My oldest son, Nick, was in active addiction. My worst fear was Nick was going to die while I was in prison. I walked out of prison. I caught my case December 16th of 2010. I walked out of prison December 16th of 2013. Three years of the day I caught the case, I walked out for the first time in my life, 13 and a half months clean and sober. My former wife picked me up. She still brought two of the kids to visit me every two weeks. Her and my mom had a little townhouse set up for me in downtown Naperville. All our furniture was in there. Nick, Max, Tanner, and Abby came over for dinner that night. We all had Portillo's, Italian beefs, and hot dogs. And that's the last time I was together with my former wife and four kids as a family. I set up my foundation, started support groups, started working in the treatment space. And then on my 21 month sobriety date, my son died from an overdose. Oh, and I had so two awful. choices to go to a meeting or go get high. I didn't have a thought to use. As soon as Shannon and I got to that ER and said, Tim and Shannon Ryan here to see our son, Nick, he overdosed. And 30 seconds later, that chaplain walked out. I, I knew my son was dead. Oh my and God, I, I asked people, I'll ask people, what was my next thought? Most people say you wanted to get high. No, my next thought was I'll be at a meeting. But I had to go and identify Nick. Go oh tell Shannon, yes, yes, he's dead. And I'll never forget that scream. And then taking my former wife in there and, uh, you know, looking over our dead son. And I will be the first one to say I helped kill my own son. Oh my and I have God. to live with that for the rest of my life. I am responsible for killing my child. And I have two choices. I can, I can live in that negativity or I can take that negative and turn it into a positive. And, and that's what I'm doing today. In the emergency room, Shannon said, I hate God, F God. He didn't answer my prayers. And I looked at her and I said, Shannon, what I'm going to say is going to sting. But listen to me. I said, maybe God did answer our prayers. It's just not the answer we're looking for. And two weeks later, Shannon and I had lunch. And she looked me right in the eyes and she said, Tim Ryan, for once in my life, I'm behind you a thousand percent. She said, I want you to run your foundation. I want you to help people. I want no parent going through what I went through. Heroin took you, my husband, our beautiful home, and my firstborn son. She said, I thought about what you said in the emergency room. She said, I truly believe God had you go through all your struggles, put Nick and I in your life, had had Nick go through his for Nick to pass on to set the stage for what you're going to do next. And I'm just getting started. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Yeah, so so I got out. I met a friend of mine, Suzette Papadakis, who's who's one of the top clinicians I've ever met. She's a trauma therapist. She's one of my best friends. We opened a treatment center together, but she really helped me work through a lot of my issues. We talk daily. She guides and directs me. From a clinical standpoint, as a friend, she'll call me on my bullshit. And I've surrounded myself with people I can learn from. It's as simple as that, you know. Yeah. You, you you are a product of the five people you associate with. And I only hang out with people I'm going to learn from that can better me. And I've cut all toxic people out of my life. Yeah, you have to. You do, though, surround yourself with people that, like, you're reaching a hand back. You're not only surrounding yourself with people that you can learn from. But, I mean, it's so crystal clear that you're reaching a hand out to help so many people right and and that's all i can do you know that's all i can do yeah um it's my mission yeah i'm so grateful for your ability to you know to use that for the positive because it's so it would have been so easy for you to go the other way well the easy thing would have do would would have want to go get high oh poor me poor me no i had to own my actions and I had to start bettering myself and and do the next right things for my former wife, for my three children, for my new wife, for our daughter, for my three stepchildren, for my parents to do the next right thing. But that's where I had to own it and I had to move forward and do the next right thing. And that's why I say when I speak and everything, I have a very unique story and you get a lot of people that lost a child and, and they want to speak. And I've seen a lot of these people and they just get up there and cry and it's, it's deadly. And 
you know, it's people grieve different ways. And I see two things happen. Parents that lose children, they either go into a, a, a guilt and a, a, a desperation and never get out of it, or they get involved in the solution. And those are the two things that happen. That's all. The, you got two choices. And I had to make a choice to do the next right thing. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and you are 12 step oriented and you did talk about your, your weekly habits and, and your prayer and meditation and, and all that. Did you always have a concept of God? Did you, were you raised with religion? So, yeah, I, I'm a recovering Catholic. Uh, okay. And I say that, you know, we went to church, we went to CCD. But for me, when I grew up in the Catholic faith, it was a crazy religion because I could go to confession, Father, I sinned, I, I broke out Mrs. Mary's house windows. Okay, give me five Our Fathers, five Hail Marys, everything will be fine. But if you sin, you're going to hell or you're going to rot in purgatory. My God was a fearful God. I was afraid of God. Mm -hmm. And to me, God is G-O-D, was a gift of, of desperation. I was desperate enough to put my hand up and say, my way doesn't work because I like to play God. And me playing God doesn't work. I always break out. I break out teeth, I break out windows, and I break out in a nice silver, silver pair of handcuffs. And I try to live God's will in my son Nick's world to the best of my ability. And I don't know what God is. I don't know what a higher power is, but I know there's something out there. And when I believe in that faith and that hope in that direction, the things have changed and, and I see the miracles happen. I don't blame God for, for my son dying. I blame drugs, alcohol, the disease of addiction. My yeah. son had been to treatment six times. Nick knew what to do. He chose to get high. And, and when my son died, he was with his girlfriend and two other friends. He had snorted two bags of heroin and it, this kid gave him a bar of Xanax. And about a half hour later, they knew Nick was overdosed and, and they didn't do a thing. Really? They, Put him on the sofa, went in the basement, did more drugs, forgot about him, came up an hour later, and he was dead. They drove around with his dead body for two hours, afraid to go to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, the detective took me in back to meet the three kids, tell him Nick was dead, and he pulled me aside. He said, do you want me to charge him with drug-induced homicide? I said, absolutely not. He said, well, what do you want? He looked at me dumbfounded. I said, I want to get these kids into treatment and get them some help. I said, that could have been me using with my son. But I, one of the things I talk about is the Good Samaritan law. Kids, every high school in Illinois and where they have this law, none of the schools are talking about this. None of them. And I, I get pissed at the superintendent. Kids are going to go to parties. And God forbid if someone's overdosing from alcohol or drugs, they can pick up the phone and call 911 and the police will come and the paramedics and hopefully save the person and take the drugs and leave and nobody gets arrested. Why are we not educating our children about this? Do you think they're afraid it's endorsing? No, it's it's a reality. I don't care what they're endorsing because kids are going to kids are going to experiment either way. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just a fact. You know, don't tell me they're not. I try to instill even with the weed, you know, why do you need to alter your mind in the first place? What is going on? Well, I have anxiety. I have all these pressures. When I'll ask the kids, what are the pressures in life today? School, homework, fitting in, how you dress, what you have. I mean, these kids' expectations are so unrealistic. Yeah. Um, it, it's crazy. How do we teach our kids how to manage that stress so that they don't feel the need to use in, in the first place? We need to quit putting so much on these kids. Yeah. You, you know, I've got a friend whose kid is in a very high-end school. The girl's 12 years old. She just took her ACT and received a 32. She's very, she's a genius level child. She is at home doing homework till 11 o'clock at night, five days a week. She doesn't have time to be a kid. And the mother has called the school and said, this isn't right. Yeah. You know, it, it's not right. We're going to pull our daughter out of here because she needs to ride her horse and, and be a kid too. And there's so much pressure. Number one, number one. You know what? It's okay to be number 250. And I asked the kids, do you know where happiness comes from? Yeah, your friends. No, bullshit. Happiness comes from within. Yeah. So kids all worry about the wrong. People worry about the wrong stuff today. 
Yeah. So, so are you, is your feeling that we need to shift our mindset from what we place value on and our goals and ideals to, you know, a more um, like a what's that called? Like the locus of control is being within yourself. And well, look at look at America today. Fifty percent of the families are divorced. There's no how many families actually sit down and have dinner to get. We had dinner every night at six thirty every night. How many families are actually having dinner today? How many families are having dinner without technology at the table? How many parents are truly involved in their kids' lives and know who their kids' friends are? And that friend that is the nicest, politest kid, he's usually the biggest troublemaker or the drug addict. It was like the Eddie Haskell. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, we need to take things aback. You know, you look at the the football and that we got to be number one. No, you don't. And, and let every kid play. It's not just the best players. I can remember playing baseball growing up. Every kid played every game the same amount of time. You went to practice every week. You played as much as every player did. You didn't sit people on the bench and hell, one team eyes on. We lost 15 games in a row, but everybody had fun. Yeah. Having fun is, is not is underrated. <laughs> well, you look at the average child. The average child laughs three to four hundred times a day. The average adult laughs three to four times a day. That's something wrong. Yeah, definitely. And and, and you look at work. Seventy five percent of the people that go to work every day hate their jobs. Why would you go do a career that you hate? Oh, because I want to make money. Guess what? I've had money. Money's not happiness. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, we wow. could go in a million. I know. <laughs> there's, listen, there's so much to talk about. And I do want to sort of wrap up with some of the solution stuff. Like, what are some of the things that have helped you to heal your past? And um, maybe some, what are some of the things that you do as far as like self care goes so that you can, you know, really do stress management and emotion management and help you to stay sober today? I have no, staying sober is not an issue for me. I have zero thoughts of drinking and drugs. That's completely been lifted. I attend a 12-step base program because it keeps me focused and grounded, and I like to help other people. But I see a lot of the people in the rooms. Um, I got a guy that's three years sober. He's never sponsored every, anyone. And, I, you know, the reason you go through a 12-step base program so you can take somebody else through the 12 steps. That's a miracle of the program. You've got to give this shit away to, to gain it in return. And I see people that, you know, they don't pick people up for meetings. And we need to expand it outside of the rooms. We need to get rid of this anonymous bullshit. Um, that's something I did at my TED Talk. You know, we've got 23, 24 million people in long-term recovery, but they all hide in the damn rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, yeah. Celebrate Recovery, we need to expose. So we need people coming out and saying, "Hey, I'm a brain surgeon, and I'm 12 years sober. I'm a lawyer. I'm a plumber. I'm a janitor. I'm homeless, and I'm eight years sober." We need to embrace recovery, drop all this anonymous bullshit, and quit worrying about what other people are thinking. Because until we do that, this stigma will never be dropped. I couldn't agree more. And listen, it I was that was actually going to be one of my questions for you is how do you feel about anonymity? Because, you know, in the 12 step rooms, it's, you know, they call it the the foundation of their, you know, their principles. And, you know, for me, it's a problem because my one of my goals is to end the stigma of addiction. And we can't do it if we're hiding behind anonymity. I think there's a, a place for having privacy and being able to go through your stuff in a safe, private way. But it kind of drives me crazy that the people that I'm so proud of that are in recovery, they're keeping it a secret and they don't realize. Yeah, it, it's silly. And, you know, I was doing a very high end TV interview in New York. And afterwards, the person interviewed me and said, Hey, keep doing what you're doing. I'm 12 years sober. I'm like, do people know? He's like, everybody knows, but you know, in, you, you don't walk into a mall and, hey, it's John from AA. How are you, John? But if people want to come out, they should, and they should be proud. I've had many people, oh, I can't let my boss know. I'm going to lose your job. I said, look, everybody today knows someone that's struggling with addiction. And, and be proud to be sober. But what happens is you get people, and then they fall, and, oh, well, the 12-step programs didn't work. 
no, the person quit going to meetings and, and took their own will back. You right. know, but everybody wants to point the finger and blame. Let's quit blaming. Let's look at more solutions. Yeah. You know, when I was down in San Antonio, I went to this place called The Haven. They spent $100 million. A, a philanthropist put up $30 million. He raised another seventy. They have a treatment program there where you moms can live with their children. The school bus picks them up. They have dental. They have doctor. They have everything there. Homeless people can come in. Even if they're drinking, they've got a thing set up outside with mats under the shelter where they can stay and, and sleep. And we need more peer-driven centers out there. We need, you know, everybody can't afford good insurance and, and high-end treatment is still needed. You have different clientele. But what about all the people without insurance and these peer driven recovery centers where they're getting people through the steps are working. Anybody I ask that says I relapsed, they never worked the steps. They never helped somebody else. Well, of course it didn't work. I had a event I was going to do a few years ago and the family said, well, we want you to speak and come, but you can't talk about a 12 step based program. I said, what are you talking about? Well, that's what killed my brother. Oh, my God. I, I said, no, your no. brother killed himself by using and not working a 12-step base program. And you have parents that are totally at my support groups. I have the families come with the person struggling. And then I break it up. And I've got about 80 parents in there two and a half years ago. And this mother goes, I need to know if my son's on step four or not. I said, what's step four? She goes, what? I said, well, what's step four? Well, well, I don't know. And I asked, I said, how many parents here have actually read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous? Two out of the 80 did. I said, shame on each and every one of you. Go buy a big book, read the first 164 pages so you know what your loved one is going through. Be part of the solution. Help them. Go to Al-Anon. Go to Families Anonymous. Get yourself some damn help. But people don't want to put forth the effort. Or I'll have people saying, Tim, you need to do this. You need to go talk to Congress. Get off your ass and do it yourself. Why do I need to do everything? <laughs> you can't do everything. I know. It's, it's unbelievable. But, you know, I just keep doing what I'm doing. You're doing amazing work, and I am so grateful that you are on the planet. I mean, you're using your experience, strength, and hope to help people heal. And I can't think of a greater purpose than, to tr than saving others, which is what you're doing. So I applaud you. You're, you're doing great work. And anything I can do to help you, please let me know. Well, I appreciate that. Now, are you, where are you located? I'm in California. I'm actually going to be out in L.A. next week, but uh, I'll have to come up and pop a visit up to your area. Yeah, I know you have uh, friends in this area, too. Yeah, you know? I got my little buddy Mark and Doug and. Mark, uh, yep. reach out to him. He would be grateful to do your podcast. Yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, I left him a message. I'll have you harass him, too. Um, he's well-known. Oh, I'm this, going to. Yeah, he's well-known in this area. I would love to have him. But um, listen, I, I, I want to go ahead, and I, you've been so generous with your time, and uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up now. And, and uh, maybe when you come out here, we'll do another one in person, and uh, that would be amazing. I'd love to. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It was truly an honor. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful day. Uh, say hi to your son for me, and uh, we'll talk again soon. All right. You have a better day. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.